it is, I believe, the most value creating tool that leaders have. Heidi, 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 ho. Welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast presented by Hippo Direct. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur or innovator every single Wednesday morning who's unleashing creativity to grow their business. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, digital marketing due to Hippo Direct, and you can reach me at max at hippodirect.com for any help with podcasting or digital marketing. This is episode number Cinco Ocho, and today's guest is Lindsay Peterson. She's the brains behind the branding of Starbucks, IMDb, and T-Mobile, and she's done this with her company, Ironclad Brand Strategy. Speaking of Ironclad, she has a new best-selling book called Forging an Ironclad Brand. Hear all about her scientific approach to branding used by those top brands and many more, and even why it pays to be an outsider. Get ready for Lindsay P. Enjoy the show. All righty, we are here with Lindsay Peterson, the ultimate brand strategist, the author of Forging an Ironclad Brand, and just has a client list that anybody would die to have. So <laughs> without further ado, Lindsay, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. Oh, of course. I've been working on it for my entire life, so thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we're going to get into a lot about your new book, which is coming in hot, and what you do from a brand strategy side and the amazing clients you've worked with as well. But before we get into that, let's take it back and get more into your, let's get more into your background and sort of the, where you started before you were in the business world. So can you tell everybody a little bit about sort of where you came from and what got you into your professional career in the first place? Sure. Yeah. So, oh gosh. So if I go back to college, an undergraduate, I was studying psychology and was planning on taking it really far. I was planning on getting a PhD and becoming a clinical psychologist. And there was a moment during college where I realized belatedly that what that would mean is I'd be spending six or seven years living in a random place in the middle of the country where I didn't want to live. And <laughs> And then at the end of that, it would still, I would still be a little bit fuzzy on what I was doing. So I kind of turned my back on that and I started doing management consulting for a few years with Deloitte Consulting. And, and it was kind of a, you know, I don't know what else to do, so I'm going to do this type of thing. And I did not love it, but I did find that I, I liked management. I liked business and strategy. Um, but I didn't like the kind of the environment of being a management consultant for a big firm. So yeah, and, and w the way that it works, and I think this is true with a lot of management consulting firms, after your first few years, you're actually required to go to business school in order to be welcome to stay. And they even offer to pay for it. And I kind of took that as, okay, I am going to go to business school, but I'm probably not going to come back into management consulting. So that's what I did. I, was, I got my MBA and it sounds so, you know, at the time when you're applying to business school, you have to say what you want to do with your degree. So I had a really good story about that at the time, but in hindsight, I think I was kind of flailing and, and fortunately enough, I found marketing when I was in business school and found that I really liked it and kind of melded the psychology um, love that I had with strategy that I also found that I had loved. So that's how, that's how that got started. Ah, I see. So it's uh, so you've been very strategic about your choices where to go to school and kind of the next step of your career. I I like. I mean, I'm interested. I, well, I took. Let's be clear here. I took introduction to psychology. So I took one cl psych class in college. <laughs> so not quite, not quite the same as majoring in it, but there are elements of psych and the science side of things that I find fascinating. Uh, I'd love to hear from your side, what made you go into psychology in the first place and what initially made you think that you were going to quote unquote, go the distance with psychology? Mm, yeah. Yes. 
oh gosh. So, and this was a long time ago, but so I'm, um, no, I'll, no, I'll no. Pretend that I, that, that I, that, that, that it was really thoughtful. <laughs> You know, I, I think, and maybe even going back to being a little kid, I have always been very fascinated by humans and kind of human behavior and kind of getting inside of the head of the person you're talking to and understanding them and, and being there for them in a way that they need. That was all, has always kind of tugged at me. And even as a kid, I even remember in high school, I was I was often sought out almost like a therapist on campus, like, <laughs> like a, like a shoulder to cry on. So there, there must've been something in my wiring that led me to that. And then the intellectual fascination with human behavior. I think that's what, that's what made me want to keep studying it because I was so hungry to understand that better. Yeah. It's neat. It goes back to, to an early age, and um, I'm glad, just for all the listeners here, it's I'm glad everybody knows they have another shoulder to cry on just in case. So thank you for, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being here for, from that regard as well. So you're interested in that and in, in the human side, the, the natural curiosity from a, a behavior and how people interact standpoint really, really comes in handy from a marketing and a branding side. As you mentioned, once you got more into the consulting world and the business world, you had some, you were a brand manager in amazing positions at Clorox and were there for several years. Can you speak about that time a little bit? I mean, Clorox, it's a massive, massive brand there. And anybody knows who's familiar with the brand management space, just it's basically like running your own business within a business there when you have the brand on hand. Can you, can you tell us about that time of your life for a little bit? Sure. Yeah. And for listeners, the model, the brand management model, which Procter & Gamble kind of originated in the middle of the 20th century. And now a lot, most probably consumer packaged goods firms use it and Clorox included. Clorox actually used to be part of Procter & Gamble. And the way that kind of the, the idea of it in these these big businesses like Procter and Gamble is they have dozens, sometimes hundreds of brands, hundreds of businesses. So at Clorox, we had certainly, you know, we had Clorox bleach, but we also had fresh step cat litter and Casey masterpiece barbecue sauce and glad garbage bags and Brita water filters and Kingsford charcoal. <laughs> quite, quite the range there. <laughs> yeah. A vast range, dozens of businesses. And as the brand manager of one of these businesses, you're tasked with growing the business. So you're, you're a P&L owner, you're a general manager. And um, outside of consumer packaged goods, you probably wouldn't call this a brand manager. You'd call it a general manager or a CEO. So you're the CEO of Casey Masterpiece Barbecue Sauce. And so what that means is that you get this small, small, relatively small, small business that you get to run and grow and you develop the innovation pipeline and you do the marketing and you figure out the supply chain and you do demand planning, you're managing a team, a cross-functional team. So it really is, for me, it was a phenomenal way to understand the very guts of business and the very kind of the crux of how you, how you, how you take an idea and you scale it through the products that you bring. Yeah, and on such a large scale there. I mean, we I used to work at a, a competitor of, of PNG and let's just say we were aware of the advertising budgets from Proctor's side. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's big. It's it yeah, but you and, and the revenue as well, obviously. I mean, massive brands, some of the some brands billion dollars plus even. But it does give you such an amazing idea of how to run the business and all the ins and outs of it when you are sort of at the uh the, the hub of the wheel there in the brand management role. So it's, it's amazing that you've had that experience with such big name brands like that. What do you think? So that was kind of, there, there's a positive side of that, but on the negative side, you know, what ultimately led you away from that world and to more, really more go out on your own? Oh gosh. I mean, a lot of things. One is that um, Clorox, and this is true of a lot of consumer packaged goods companies and old economy companies, it's extremely risk adverse. So just by culture, there it's shareholders reward consistent returns and, and therefore that kind of informs the way that you run a business. You really, really keep, you don't stick your neck out. And 
uh, that was great training. And then it didn't work real well with my kind of, you know, what I like to do and my wiring. That's probably important then. <laughs> it is. And it's, and I think, you know, it's, I think it's worth saying that not everybody, not, not, not everybody would feel that way. A lot of people really do like that kind of more slow, steady um, environment. So it's right. just good to, it's just to, it's, it's just good to know yourself. And, um, and if you're not liking it, then, you know, there comes a point when it's, it's good to look elsewhere. So that was, that was the reason that that wasn't a forever job. Um, not that I think any job should be a forever job, but I was going to say that a forever job might be a pretty big commitment. No, I, yeah, I actually don't even think it's not, that's not a very useful construct anymore. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so I left Clorox and, and actually at the same time as I was leaving Clorox, we were moving my husband and small child at the time we were moving to Seattle. To, so that was a family decision. We wanted to be in Seattle. And, and so I started doing consulting as I was kind of getting my footing in a new market. So I was doing consulting with companies like Starbucks that uh, really understood the brand management framework that I had come from. And uh, so I, I was doing consulting projects in that capacity, not in a very, um, I want to do this for a living capacity, but I let, let me kind of do this for a while. And I found that I really liked it. I found that being on the outside worked really well for me. I felt that I could be really candid and objective uh, in a way that I couldn't when I was on the inside. And that, that was really that got me really jazzed. And so instead of it being a temporary thing, it became um, a longer term thing. And I really built this business, um, Ironclad Brand Strategy, to bring the lens of consumer packaged goods branding to businesses outside of that world that could use the discipline, but otherwise wouldn't have access to it. What I think is so cool about that is you hear the concept of outsider advantage and how looking at something from an outsider or more of a quote unquote fresh perspective, sometimes it just gives you ideas and ways to enhance a business or add new insights that just when you're kind of stuck in the thick of things, you don't think. And you've taken that approach and done it with your career to the point that you're like a, you know, like more of a, a permanent or full-time outsider now, <laughs> which. That's right. I, I re and, and I think it's interesting when I hear you articulate it like that. And I think, you know, I think for most people, they wouldn't like that. You know, they, they wouldn't like being on the outside or, the, or, or they wouldn't want to do it all the time. Mm -hmm. For me personally, I really love it. And, and I think you're right. I think that there's, intrinsic value in no matter what business you're running getting fresh eyes and it, because you can't you just can't see it when you're that close to it it was my experience as a brand manager at Clorox when I would bring in consultants to help me to develop a, you know a brand architecture or you know a, some surgical project I was amazed at how you know, it's like you can't see the inside of your own eyelids. That sheer, sheer perspective was a huge part of the value. And, and, and I have found, much to my joy, I have found that I really, I really like being that person who's saying, oh, you're really close to it. Let's, let, me, let me show you what it looks like if you step back. Yeah, I well, appreciate the, the the graphic example at the back of the eyelids. I think that's. Oh, uh, that sounds gross. Now that I say <laughs> it. Oh, uh, well, okay. So now now I made it weird. But <laughs> but yeah, no. See, it's it's a great point, and it's good that you. Yeah, I think it definitely. You know, some people would like it being from the outside perspective. Some people don't. But for you, and with the experience you've had, and also being on the inside previously, I think it's such a great fit, and you you clearly excel at what you do. So let's get to the quote unquote outside. <laughs> let's okay. talk about, let's talk about, let's get to your ironclad consulting business. So you have ironclad brand strategy and we'll get to your, you've released a book recently that hits a nail on the head as far as your main messaging and you know, the mission you're behind with everything. But 
We'll get to get that in a little bit. Before we get to the actual book, let's talk about ironclad brand strategy. So just to kind of take us back a step, when you think of the word brand, what does that mean in your eyes? So happy you asked this because <laughs> it's the impetus for my writing the book that I wrote is that the word brand takes people to wildly different places. And it means that a lot of times when one person is saying brand, what the listener hears is, oh, like a logo um, or some other manifestation of brand. So yeah, like the creative side. Yeah. Right. Right. Part, which is part of it. The way that I define brand is your brand is, is the idea that your business owns in the mind of your customer. So what is the thing that you mean to your customer? And what I contend is that not all brand ideas are created equal. Not all brand ideas are equally attractive to you as a business. So it's worth it to be really deliberate when you articulate that brand that you want to stand for uh, so that you can make decisions that reinforce that idea in a way that'll create more value for your business in a way that only your business can create. That's not something that others can do as well. Right. Yeah. And I think that's a huge key. The key to everything is that unique aspect of what you can, what you and only you can provide because obviously nobody else can do that. <laughs> so as far as the name and the term ironclad, because you don't see ironclad tossed around, you know, too, it doesn't come up in everyday conversation. Now, when everybody's reading your book, of course it does. But in everyday conversation, the term ironclad, how did you decide to focus on that terminology? And, and to you, what's the difference between an ironclad brand and kind of the, as just a, the typical or stereotypical brand you hear about? Yes. The word ironclad actually came from a client who said, after we finished the brand strategy, he said, oh my God, I love this because it's just ironclad. It's not squishy. It's like, oh, it's just like, oh, it's so ironclad. <laughs> and it was one of those moments that, you know, I have learned to recognize as, oh, I need to listen to that. And I think if I kind of if I kind of span out from that moment, I work with CEOs usually. I'm, I'm working with general managers, people who often don't have marketing backgrounds, people who have ownership of the business, either general managers or CEOs, um, sometimes CMOs who have P&L ownership. And to business owners, you know what they really hate? They really hate things that are squishy. They hate things that are like kind of feel sort of fuzzy or gratuitous. And the, the reputation of brand, the brand of brand, if you will, um, is to be <laughs> this sort of this squishy thing uh, that is, a, is something that my clients are allergic to. And frankly, I kind of am allergic to squishy too because most of my career I've been in the client's shoes as a general manager. And I just, I want, I want something hard that can guide me. And so I really, I have a lot of empathy for that, for that viewpoint. So creating a brand strategy that is the opposite of squishy is what I seek to do. So it's, it's, it's analytically driven. It's, it's going to be, it's going to hold, it's disciplined. It holds up to interrogation. That's the kind of brand strategy that ends up being the most useful to the leader and the most value creating for the people who own the business. And put in other terms, we're all just trying to be the opposite of squishy, if I gather that correctly. Yeah, right. pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good motto to live by. <laughs> but it, it's cool. It's cool it came from a client. And speaking of clients, I mean, I, I alluded to your client list earlier. Uh, Starbucks, IMDb, Zulily, uh, T-Mobile. I mean, the, these are some of the biggest brands out there and just the most well-known and some might say ironclad. So <laughs> when you, or after they talk to you clearly, but my, you know, so my first question there is how did you come into contact and start working with these iconic brands? Yeah. 
Yeah. That's very kind of you to say. And I feel, I feel really proud of the clients I've worked with too. And I'll hasten to add that a lot of my clients are also smaller kind of startups. I work with a lot of series A, series B startups that someday would like to become, you know, Zulily and Starbucks. Right, yeah. Um, I love working with them as well. So it's kind of, gosh, um, if I kind of think chronologically about it, initially companies like Starbucks and T-Mobile, those were my first clients. Those are businesses that already had a huge philosophical alignment with brand management and, and the consumer packaged goods way of using brand. In fact, the head of marketing at T-Mobile had been a, one of my bosses at Clorox. So at oh. Seattle. So yeah, so, so that it was kind of my, my network, my Clorox alumni network initially that was the case early on as I was, I've, I've now been doing this for 12 years. So for those first couple of years, I was really working with businesses like that, that already got it, that already knew that, yeah, brand is not a logo. Brand is what you stand for. Yeah, um, yeah. Right. So, and then as time has gone on, some of this is just organic that, you know, somebody left Starbucks to run, you know, a, another startup and they had me, come do their brand strategy, left, you know, yeah, left Starbucks to go to IMDB or so on and so forth. So right. some of it was that organic in that way. And, and actually most of it's that, that's kind of word of mouth or past clients becoming repeat clients. And then the other way I suppose is that I, be, I have a lot of heart for working with con well, not necessarily consumer, but usually consumer brands that are startups. So Zulily, at the time I was working with them, was they weren't a startup, but they were not um, the big company that they are now either. And I knew people there, and they knew my work from other from you know from from these other brands that I had worked with. And so I I did their brand strategy, and then I did some of their did their investors brand strategy. And so it just sort of, it's, it's sort of percolated. That sound is, that sounds more, um, it sounds more thoughtful than it really was. I, I was, <laughs> you know, I, I was, I was following my nose and it, it yeah. worked out that way. Gotcha. Like Toucan Sam. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Why not? Sure. But it, it, but it's proof like, it, so it's a mix of ways that you got them, but that's like, you're, walking, living, breathing proof of how powerful and impactful your network can be. And sometimes, you know, even if you don't stay at a job for, you know, for life, as you say, sometimes if it's more of a shorter term thing, it's the relationships that you meet there and the connections. And sometimes it's not first degree connections, but it can be second and third degree connections that who knows who you end up doing business with or collaborating with in certain ways. And so for, and for you, that has helped to lead to just some top, top notch clients. So <laughs> that's, it's wonderful to hear. A hundred percent. It's, it, this is a relationship business. Even, I mean, you know, it was a long time ago. I was working for Deloitte consulting before business school and Deloitte consulting is a, you know, a global, a huge consulting firm. And even at Deloitte consulting, it's a relationship business. It's really about the relationship between, in their case, the partner and the, the buyer on the client side. And so it's the case with the big companies. It's really the case with us, with a very small consulting business like mine. It is. And I've seen it from, uh, from the podcast side as well. Since this is an interview show and we have a new guest every single week, there's been some episodes now, some guests that are referrals of refer. Uh, it's like a previous guest who refers a future guest who refers another guest. Like it's, it goes on and on and on. And in this example, just to get meta in this example right now, I was introduced to you and your book through Steve Woodruff, the King of Clarity, who was a previous guest on the show. And he just could not say enough kind words about you and your book. So that's how this whole thing was connected. So it's really, uh, it's always just fascinating to me who's connected to who and what things will lead. Because you never know what even just a five minute conversation with somebody can lead to. It's so true. I'm a huge believer in it. And shout out to Steve because he is awesome. 
He's the king, the king of clarity. <laughs> yes, he is. He's yeah. He's got the uh, yeah. He's got the the memory dart of all memory darts. <laughs> but, it really does. It's awesome. Yeah. So, on that note, let's get to your book. So, your new book, Forging an Ironclad Brand, is doing fantastic. The reviews are amazing, and it's a really really cool concept that you know has has some teeth in in what you've done from a as a uh, as a consultant and brand strategist for over the past decade now. So for anybody that's not familiar with the book, can you give a brief background of why you put these thoughts into book form and why, you know, why you chose this route to get your message out there? Sure. Yeah, so the impetus was I kept realizing I was having the same conversation with people over and over again, people outside of consumer packaged goods about what brand is and why it matters to companies other than Procter and Gamble. And I had this kind of bee in my bonnet to spread the word that brand strategy is just an essential tool for leadership. It's not something that only big marketing budget companies can use and it's not something that only b2c companies use and it's not certainly not something only for consumer packaged goods it is i believe the most value creating tool that leaders have and it's seemed downright silly that uh one industry consumer packaged goods was making a lot of use of it while others thought that brand was a logo so <laughs> I, you know, so I kept having these conversations um, and, and I kept finding that my clients sort of, it was almost like this sense of relief to have this North Star that, that a brand strategy serves as for making decisions across the business. Certainly the obvious things that you think of with brands, marketing campaigns and messaging, but also innovation and who do we hire and what kinds of products should we build and not build? What, how should we price this? Who should we partner with? These decisions that are so overwhelming oftentimes for a leader and to have a guiding principle from the brand strategy is one, it's, it, it creates way more of a flywheel effect of value creation when everything is lined up together. And two, it makes leadership so much more gratifying to be building toward this purpose that everybody can rally behind. So having this conversation over and over, I was seeing that clients were feeling incredibly empowered by this tool. And the bee in my bonnet was, I want people to hear this, people who can't use me as a consultant to do their brand strategy. I want them to be able to do it. I want them to be able to, to understand brand in this, um, this big and empowering way and to be able to build brand strategies without the help of a brand strategist. So that was the impetus. And that's what my book seeks to do is demystify brand, show how it's important for everybody and show a method for building one. And it's a powerful mission and a powerful method. And there's some science behind it too. I mean, there's a, it's not all a, uh, you know, more of a traditional marketing approach or, or thinking approach behind everything. There's some, some science, a more scientific approach that goes into it. Can you speak about that for a little bit? And which I'm sure ties to your interest in psychology and behavior from an early age. Sure. So the the step by step method it's an eight step method that i use when i'm building a brand strategy for my clients it starts with i call the step orienting so establishing who is the target customer who is the person that you want your business to optimize for um, who is that person and what is what's the context in their life where your your product or your offering or your service that what what's the problem that they're trying to solve when they would use your offering um, so kind of orient to who is this person and what are they doing now because they're not using what you offer so that's that's the first thing and to some people that's really easy and clear and we can do that right away and to others it feels really scary to 
say, oh, here's our target customer because there's this feeling of what about all the people that are not described by this target customer? I, I'd like to do business with them as well. Yeah. For those people, what I, I encourage them to think about, um, this is not a, um, it's not a false it, it's it's not a dichotomy. It's like you have a target customer and you also have an addressable market and your, your addressable market, people who are going to buy, who may buy your product, but are not your target customer. That's great. They can still buy it. We just don't want to optimize for the people who are not in the bullseye. And what I mean by bullseye is who is the person who brings outsized value to your business, either monetary value or philosophical value or, um, you know, loyalty value, who are those people? And similarly, who are the people that your business serves the best? Um, who are the people who would be really, really sad if your business went away? So you want to make your brand decision according to this person at the bullseye. Doesn't mean that you don't get to serve people outside of it. It just means you're going to optimize for the center. Right. Yeah. And, and I, well, I think that's key too, is, is optimize for the center. There's still, you can still get your message across to other people and, and get your products or services out to other people. It's just, if you, you might as well, might as well aim for that bullseye because there's, there's more on that dartboard there. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. It's, it might feel a little bit scary, but it's actually just, it's taking this idea that all of us marketers know that you can't be all things to all people. It's taking that principle that you already knew and it's just recognizing its truth and being really in a humble way, knowing that you can't serve everybody equally. I mean, not even the biggest, most high budget brands in the world can. So it's um, it's simply a recognition of we all have our strengths and our and our our target customer has you know a variety of needs and we're going to focus on the ones who we have the best chance of serving. Yeah, I see. And so it's so it's kind of a specific thing there. And another thing that you talk about, you know, you hear the term common denominator, but you are all about the uncommon denominator. So that's, there's the distinction there that I really like. So what the hell is the uncommon denominator? <laughs> yes, I'm so happy that you picked up on that. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the biggest error that I see among brand building, is that a company focuses on, on, on something that they're really good at and that their, their customer really wants and that their competitor is also good at. Those benefits are table stakes. Um, when you're talking about the, the, the category benefit, so say it's lemonade, and you know, a category benefit of lemonade is that it's refreshing and it quenches thirst. If you're a lemonade brand, your brand can't just be about thirst quenching. That's called being lemonade you have to have something that only you can deliver on something that the customer wants that you're really good at bringing to that customer and that your competitors cannot bring. That's the uncommon denominator. And when you focus on that in your positioning, you're creating, you're creating more of what only you can create. That doesn't mean that you ignore the common denominator, the category benefit. Of course you have to do that. That's, that's just hygiene. If you're lemonade, you can't stop being thirst quenching. You do have to do that and you have to invest in it, but it can't be your focus for, um, unless you own the category, like you're the only brand in the lemonade category, you're going to be building the, you're going to be building the category demand without creating outsized demand for your specific business. So it's, it's interesting because I'm, I'm surprised by how common it is for businesses to choose a positioning that is just a category benefit. Maybe it's because it's more obvious, so it's, um, it's, it's easier to see it. Maybe it's because it feels safer because you know that you know, quenching thirst is a big need if you're a lemonade brand. But 
there's something that only your company can do that differentiates your, co your company. And when you can isolate that, you can make more of it and you can create more of a bond with customers who will seek you out because you're the only one who can bring that thing. So can you give us an example of that? Like think back to the brands that you've advised as far as Starbucks, IMDB, could, could be someone else. And whether this is in the book or not, what's an example of, of a brand that's done an amazing job of focusing on what only they can provide and incorporating that as part of their brand and messaging? Yeah, a brand that I love for this that I think does such a sharp job of it is Volvo. Volvo, you know, so if you think about the car category, a car, it makes you mobile. That's the category benefit is it gets you places. And, and if you're in the luxury or semi-luxury tier of autos like Volvo is, then it also has to be really comfortable and it has to look stylish. Right, those are category benefits. But right. Volvo is the only one who uh, specifically owns safety, and that's been true since their roots in the late 1920s in Sweden. So when other car brands make safety advancements, they're not able, it's this competitive moat for Volvo because even though there are car brands that have at least parity safety features to Volvo, Volvo owns safety in the mind of the audience. And so it creates this, you know, if, if, if you're in the market for a car and the, most, the thing that's really salient for you as a, as a customer is safety, Volvo is going to be on your list of cars that you're going to drive or that you're going to test drive, right? It's, so, it's not just comfortable and stylish and gets you from point A to point B. Those are category benefits. It's also the safest car on the road. It is. Yeah. And it's so true. I mean, right when you said Volvo, it's impossible to hear Volvo and not think of safety. Like it was, it was instant when you mentioned it. And I, so it was just, just proof. It's proof how well they've embraced that as part of their brand and how big of a focus it is for them. And so I, I love that example. It's perfect. Hey, wild listeners. Have you been wanting to start a podcast for yourself or your business, but didn't know where to start? Or do you have a podcast of your own, but you're struggling with the time commitment? I'd love to help. Shoot me an email at max at hippodirect.com with any podcasting questions you have. I'm also happy to jump on a 30-minute call where we can discuss your idea, planning, production, promotion, and other elements of the podcasting world. Let your podcast run wild. Let's move on. Let's switch gears a little bit here. So let's get into inspiration and creativity from your standpoint. So what do you do to stay creative? Ah, oh, I love this question. <laughs> I'm glad. Um, I love this question. Two things immediately came to mind. One is I am relentlessly curious about people. And so I love just talking to people. It, it is to me that that's, that opens up all of my creativity channels. And so talking to people, uh, listening to podcasts actually is, is kind of, it's like a way of you're, you're kind of overhearing a conversation and that's really inspiring to me. So that, mm. that really gets my creative juices flowing. The second thing that might sound really different is I really like quiet. So if I'm, <laughs> I was going to say, that's about the complete like the opposite, opposite of what you just it's said. The opposite. <laughs> I don't, I, I love learning about people but if i'm actually in the mode of creating you know writing for my book or creating a brand strategy for one of my clients i like a really low sensory environment i like it to be quiet um i like to have my internet off i like you know i'll my my laptop is is on silent I don't like people to bother me while I'm in the midst of it. So I really like a sense of spaciousness when I'm kind of head, heads down. I've been really influenced by the book Deep Work. Do you know it? By Cal Newport, who's no. the professor at Georgetown. Oh my gosh. I'm, so Deep Work by Cal Newport. And the idea is that we, especially among knowledge workers, when we have a life where we set up our work so that we can have carved out blocks of time that are just for deep thinking, we are wildly more 
productive and creative than when our day is broken up by interruptions. And uh, so I lean into that a lot and I really, I protect creative time that where I know I'm not going to be interrupted for things where I want to be my most creative. The rest of the time I like to be talking to people, listening to podcasts, reading books, learning from others. But when I, when it's like I'm rolling up my sleeves and I'm building something, I like it quiet. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same way. I think it's definitely a healthy balance of uh, talk, 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 listen, listen, listen. And then kind of the more introverted or thinking side of things. That's, that is, it is more quiet. So as far as the deep work side, which it it sounds like a very deep book, by the way, but Mm. on on the deep (laughs) side of things, I mean, it's a clever way of thinking about it, of really focusing. I'm curious more of the ideology behind that. Like, is this, is the concept behind it more of like, you're going to more or less quote unquote, lock yourself in a, in a room or, or work for like four or five hours at a time or a full day at a time? Or what's like, how, how is that portrayed? In my case, I like to reserve mornings for creative time. Um, and because that's when I'm the most, I have the best output and yeah, after yeah. for more talk time. Um, that's, that's me. I don't, I think that it depends on, depends on how you're wired. But the, I think the bigger philosophy of deep work is we live during a time when our attention is um, our most scarce resource and it's getting scarcer and you have to protect it. You know, um, if, if you're always beholden to your email inbox and your tech, you know, Slack and texting on your phone, if you, you, you won't have attention to create things that only you can create. And um, half of it is just recognizing that, like, holy smokes, a lot of our time goes into things that end up not making you feel better or create more. And when when you have that recognition, it it makes you rethink, like, gosh, I mean, I don't have social media on my on my iPhone, for example, at all. Really? Yeah, none. Huh. Um, has it always been that way, or has uh, been a change you made? It is a change that I have made and it might have been around the time that I read Deep Work that I was like, yeah, why do I have this on here? It totally just splinters my day and does, and I don't get anything out of it. Um, it's not that I'm anti-social media. It's just that I'm, I'm pro using tools in a, in a way that works best with my rhythm. So I do use social media. I just use it on my laptop. So, you know, if I'm waiting for the bus, instead of checking Facebook, I'm staring off into space and just kind of um, having a relaxing moment. So that's- How, how dare you have a relaxing moment? I know, it seems, <laughs> it's, it's funny that this seems like such a subversive act to yeah. remove social media from your phone. It really, like that's, a, that's fascinating because it uh, it's, it's really not that big of a deal. I'm still on social media, I just don't have it on my phone. Um, so, and it doesn't mean that, that doesn't mean that it's that's how it should be for everybody. That's just what I have learned makes me feel my best. And I have just become very protective of my attention and, you know, leaks on my time. And that was, that was a pretty easy one, honestly, that, you know, maybe the first like two weeks I felt a little bit twitchy. And then I realized that I had, holy cow, like I, I'm like reading more books now. I am <laughs> It's, it's like, not, it's, it's really not that, it's, it's really kind of a no-brainer in my mind. For me, for me, not everybody, I don't, I don't like think right. that everybody needs to do that, but it, it's, it clearly makes, makes me better. Well, I think anybody who's pretty like heavy social media user, I think the thought of taking an app off your phone that you use all the time, at first it's like, oh my God, like, how, how do, how, like I, I would never be able to function that way. But I think once you get over that initial shock, you really, it could really open up your, your mind to things. So it's, it's really unique, but really, really cool. I like it a lot that you do that on your phone. It's an interesting strategy. And as far as the, the other side of things, like the, uh, the more talk or listen side, you mentioned podcasts. Uh, obviously this is, you know, this is the only podcast ever created. So, so thank you. <laughs> uh, but but uh, it, in addition to this one, what are your favorite podcasts? What comes to mind? What do you like to listen to? Mm. 
I'm going to open my phone right now and see what's on there. Okay. Oh, so you do have podcast apps. That's so that's I do. <laughs> I'm a heavy. Po- I have a, I'm very, yeah. Like I use my phone. I just don't use it for social media. Okay. So I love, um, there's a, a podcast called office hours. That is three Harvard business school professors talking about current events and pop culture. And I love that. Another one I love, How I Built This with Guy Raz, talking about companies that ha- and their origins. I mm-hmm. love that. And another one that might not surprise you, given our conversation about social media, is called 10% Happier with Dan Harris. It's a podcast about mindfulness and meditation and kind of living a better life. So that's another one that I Yeah, love. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. 110%. I'll give it. couple quicker segments to wrap it up here. First one is a fan favorite segment called the wild business shout out of the week. The wild business shout out of the week. So wild business shout out of the week is where you talk about a, an ad or campaign that caught our attention. And you were mentioning, we were chatting earlier and you were mentioning still to this day, there's a Super Bowl ad from years ago that sticks with you as just such a phenomenal execution. Can you speak about that a little bit? Yes, I can. I hope that listeners have seen this ad. And if you haven't, you should check it out on YouTube. It's called um, uh, The Force and it's a Volkswagen ad. And it did premiere during the 2011 Super Bowl. And there's a little boy who's dressed up like Darth Vader. And he's, you know, he's like sticking his hand out at his parents' Volkswagen to try to turn the lights on through by using the force and he's getting kind of frustrated because it's not working and then his all of a sudden he does it and the lights go on on the car and he's looking so pleased with himself and then it pans to the parents who are holding the remote for the car for for the uh the i guess the lights of the car and (laughs) the lightsaber of the car yeah the lightsaber of the car and It is, it's so, it's so heartwarming. And I think there's something so universally lovable about this little boy dressed up as Darth Vader trying to use the force and that he believes in himself or believes in magic so much that he was able to do this to the car. I think that it probably affected me a lot because in 2011, my son was about that age. So it looked, it particularly stirred my heart, but it's- Oh my God. Just, so they made well, this for you. <laughs> I think I felt like they made it for me. They were trying to to tug at my heartstrings and it worked. Yeah. So they hit the emotional side. I mean, hit the nail on the head from that standpoint. Uh, you are obviously, you and your son are a perfect fit at the time it came out for it. And they- did a really nice job of integrating the product features as well. And they meet as a, and just like the, the ability to turn the lights on and, and to control things with the, uh, with, with the keys of the car from, you know, from a distance away, that's something that at surface level doesn't seem like anything too special, but they turned it into this beautiful family moment in this comedy moment, really this humor moment as part of it. So they did an amazing job with that. And I think it's, it's proof how well it worked because you know there's so many commercials in the Super Bowl every year that brands just spend millions on every single year, and so many of them are forgettable. But this one, you know, I still remember it like it was yesterday. But <laughs> this one several years ago, and it's still top of mind for you. So that's amazing. It's genius. It is. So only got a little bit of time. Would love to wrap up with some rapid fire Q and A. You ready for okay. it? Okay. Yep. All right. Let's get wild. Use the force. So (laughs) if there was only one food and you had to eat the same food over and over again for every meal for the rest of your life, what food would you pick? Ice cream. Easy. Okay. What flavor? Uh, If it's Haagen-Dazs, then vanilla. There you go. Oh, very specific to Haagen-Dazs. I like it. A little little endorsement there. (laughs) What is... uh, Same concept. If you... If your music app, whatever your music app of choice is that you may or may not have on your phone, knowing you, um, (laughs) if it was stuck and only had one of your songs, you could only play the same song on repeat for the rest of your life, which song would you hope that is? Red Hot Chili Peppers, Snow. 
Oh, that's a great one. Anything RHCP. So that's classic. Yeah. yeah. And then you're, so you're based in Seattle. What is your favorite part about living in Seattle? Mm. It's green. <laughs> it is. It is. That's a, that's a hell of an endorsement for a color too, but it is. <laughs> yeah. And what is, what would you say is your biggest quirk? Like something your family, maybe it's your son, maybe, maybe somebody calls you out on for that's a little bit quirky about your personality, but it's something about who you are. It makes you a little, makes you a little different. Only you can provide. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have an astounding memory for the lyrics of 80s songs. Okay. All right. So well, you're asking for it. You don't have to sing it. You don't have to sing the full song, but what's, what's a lyric, a line that comes to mind when you, when you think of that? <laughs> You can dance if you want to. You can leave your friends behind. Dun, 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 dun. All right, cool. We'll license <laughs> you got it. <laughs> we'll, we'll license that song. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> safety. Though. Yeah, of course. All right. And then what is your absolute favorite hobby? This is outside of work, obviously. Probably running. I, I, I'm an avid runner, and it's kind of a big part of my self self care ritual my mental health and in it it's i'm i'm not very nice my kids would tell you that i'm not very nice if if it's been a while since i had a run so probably running <laughs> all right well we'll let you go out and run soon to keep you nice but uh but uh lindsay that's that's going to bring us towards the end thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing everything just love what you're doing for in the brand strategy space and with your book so thanks for coming on thank you max this was really fun of course. Yes. Likewise. So before we, before we wrap up here, where is the best place for people to connect with you and where can they find your book? You got it. My book is Forging an Ironclad Brand and it's available on Amazon, etc. And um, if listeners are interested, I have a free giveaway on my business's website, which is ironcladbrandstrategy.com. It's a workbook that I adapted from my book that serves as a supplement and it gives this step-by-step -step guide of the ironclad method to building a brand strategy so you can find that at ironcladbrandstrategy.com and i would love to stay in touch you can sign up for my email newsletter there as well perfect well thank you so much for the gift and the last thing here it could be a song lyric if you want it could be a joke it could be a, a quote it's just final thoughts up to you whatever you want to send us off i would say your attention and what you're focusing your mind on is your more your most scarce asset. So protect it just like you would protect your other scarce assets, like you would protect your bank account, um, protect how you spend your time. And you can even dance if you want to. Thank you so much, <laughs> Lindsay. <laughs> Thank you, Max. Stay tuned next week for a live performance. <laughs> Now, could you imagine? Uh, thank you, Lindsay, for coming on the podcast and sharing your brilliance with us. And thank you, wild listeners, for tuning into another episode. If you feel like dancing, we hope you feel like subscribing as well. Make sure to subscribe on your favorite platform and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We also have more helpful business and marketing resources than any other company named HippoDirect you've ever come across. And you can reach those at hippodirect.com slash blog and hippodirect.com slash newsletter. That newsletter is the Hippo Digest, and it's your weekly recap of creative marketing from all around the web. And last but not least, come say, how you doing, on your favorite social media platforms at the handles Hippo Direct and Max Brandstetter. I will see myself out. Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos! Bongos!